in 2009, I took part in another, in a, in a, in another research study which had, uh, was taking place, carried out by Stishing Dun in, in, in four countries in Africa. Uganda was one of those. Now, why am I bringing this up? I bring this up because when uh, uh, Helena and myself were doing the mapping survey for what at the time work was being called the small grants, was that uh, the findings of, of the 20, 2019 mapping survey was quite intriguing when you put it alongside the, 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 the findings from the survey, from, from the study of 2009. Remember, this is a two, uh, an entire decade um, separating the two studies. And these were the findings that then fed into the discussion of what shape Konyesha would, 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 would take in. Okay. Um, what it showed was that in 2009, the needs of the arts in Uganda were very primary. Many of the artists you talked to said, um, I'm looking to, to, to have skills training. I'm looking for professional development. You know, they were looking for a place to, to put their art. They were looking for exposure. Uganda is quite an isolated country. But when it came to 2019, some of the responses was, we're looking for opportunities to market our products. You know, I'm looking for partnerships. Uh, we are looking for, uh, for lawyers to help us secure our copyright. Now, by the time you're looking for a lawyer to help you secure your copyright, it means you've created quite a lot, which meant that it was quite a great distance. Why was this uh, survey carried out? Um, this co the, the, this uh, survey was, was, was contracted by CIVSOS in partnership with um, Robert Bosch, Stiftung and the Stiftung Dun, and find ways in which a small grant could be established in Uganda. Why small? For a while, I think there have been uh, structural funders. If you went back to people in the know about 10, 15 years ago, they would tell you that if in 2008, for instance, or 2010, if you were a playwright and you were trying to stage something in theater, you may do that for a while, but immediately you're looking for money to begin training people for skills. Because Uganda, we lost a lot in our two decades or three decades of civil war, the arts in Uganda was virtually shut down. So 20 years ago, it was very difficult uh, to, to, carry, to, to do anything artistic because the skills to do so were not there. If um, staging a play meant you had to train a stage manager, you know, train people in light and sound. So funding beginning in, in 2010 up to maybe to 2000, uh, around 2015, could only be structural. Some of the reasons which were discussed prior to this study was, does a condition on the ground justify a, uh, funding directly to artists a small grant? Because you don't want to give an artist so much, so little money, and then they're spending all that money retraining themselves for skills they don't know. So part of the mapping survey was to find out who are the artists? Where are they? What art is there in Uganda? You know, the five W, some of us were journalists, so we borrowed all of that from journalism, but we could go on. So this is what the survey found out, that yes, indeed, the arts in Uganda were very much alive. Visual arts, literature, music, dance, theater, and film. But so what is most in, in, impressive about all of this was that the variations that you found within these different sectors, the variations that you now find, for instance, in visual art, the, the range of things people are doing is just incredible, impressive. Uh, there was a time when art in Uganda meant sculpture or painting, uh, gallery-led art. But now you have street art performances. You know, you've got uh, trucks driving around with pictures. <laughs> you've, got, uh, you, you've got wonderful uh, singers, you know, dressed up in plastic in Gaba. So that really shows you that uh, it, the, the, the broadening range and complexity just shows you that there's grounding, sufficient grounding. Or literature. Well, I've been put, uh, put there uh, poetry and publish. It should, should really be obvious, isn't it, that if you have literature, there should be publishing and poetry. But no, you know, there's literature itself. But publishing as, as almost a life force in itself, as a field that needs to be developed separate from the writing. If you went back 20 years ago, and you were a writer, you went to FemWrite to train to write. But uh, you know, thousands of people have been trained to write, so where, where is the manuscript going? And this is why, at a certain point in time, training in skills in Uganda became also necessary to train those who enable art to happen. 
I think this is this is the key finding of twenty of twenty nineteen as opposed to two thousand and nine, that uh, skills training is now about technical teams. If you're a dancer, if you train a dancer, you definitely are going to have to train a choreographer. If you train a filmmaker, you have to train a producer. If you train a writer, you have to train an editor. So this is a very, very um, this is the situation in which we find ourselves. Now, why was Gulu, Karamoja, and Kampala chosen? It wasn't really necessarily random. There's a, a great deal of activities going on in Gulu. And Gulu functions as a kind of cultural capital for Northern Uganda. So maybe if you went to Gulu, you'd, you'd, you'd be able to get a very good snapshot. And Karamoja, I think, represents a different, a, a different kind of reality for Uganda. I mean, the, historically, Karamoja has uh, had its special characteristics. You know, its relationship to the state has not been like everybody else. But uh, there's been groundbreaking work, especially by such organizations as Native, Sarah and Segai mostly, you know, they, they are names that you really have to recognize, who took pioneering arts uh, um, education in Karamoja. So that was really very, very exciting um, a, um, place to go to. I think it would also give a, it also gave us sufficient, uh, wonderful contrast with Kampala. We spoke to, I think, well over 120, which is quite a lot, actually, when you can, come to consider it, because this, was, um, this wasn't just uh, people filling in forms. These were focus group discussions. We borrowed this from the 2009 study, this structure of reporting, that uh, all the responses that we received, we decided to group them. A lot of those responses were personal professional issues, those to do with how they fight with the market. And obviously society is a very important uh, shaper or de-shaper of art for that matter. It plays a positive role, but it can also play a very negative role. Maybe in Uganda, we are at a point where the negative is still higher than the positive. But, but uh, you give it time, be patient. I think there's going to be a balance. Sectoral, like what is it about the sector that the artist is in that, that consumes a waking moment? Huh? Then infrastructure, where do you do your art from? Where is the space? And production, you know, this is, this is one key thing. It's, um, this survey was uh, three, two, th almost three years ago. Things have moved on, and uh, production is, is definitely becoming, I think, one of those key things to watch for the next decade. Just to give an example of the responses received, just, just this one here. So, so, for instance, when it came to the pa uh, personal and professional, artists were saying things like, we, we feel that we are part of a growing industry. Hmm? Somebody says, I want to be glorious. I'm being paid for my work now. You know, it's, not, it's no longer pro bono. And you're not being paid because somebody feels, ah, artists also, you know, let's support them. They actually need you in very many places. Huh? I'm being recognized for my work. I think uh, the Kuonyesha is a, a very, very big example of this kind of recognition. Um, my career is going well. People appreciate what, to, what I do. It's a profession. I think that's a very, very important, uh, important uh, thing to say. If you look at this one, for instance, a professional and societal, parents may not necessarily be very, very enthusiastic about their children becoming artists. But that is less and less the case. Because um, the arts is, is almost becoming a kind of fifth, fifth pillar in our society here. That it's uh, like, like what the, media, the role the media played a generation ago, when some of the brightest names, people wanted to join the media, mass communication, remember in the 1990s, we were flocking to the course, right? <laughs> but uh, a generation later, you know, you find some of the most ambitious and the most uh, brilliant people wanting to become artists. There are also negative things uh, because we asked, what, what is it that makes you frown? People don't buy books much, you know, the silencing of artists. <laughs> Need I say more about that? Artists who, who keep, uh, you know, they, there's also the dynamics of funding. There are all kinds of things. We wanted to know the, uh, the opinion of artists of how they want the fund to be shaped. The recommendations you receive from artists. They wanted this fund to be artist-centered, policies to be artist-centered, regional, uh, sectoral, and gender variations, uh, target the most vulnerable of the artists. Also, that, uh, you know, consider that there, there are three different categories, generational-wise, of artists. There are those who've been there for all their lives, like some of us who've been watching it. But there are those who've been around for only five years. Then the most vulnerable group are those who've been around for what? Almost 10 years. You know, they've gotten out of university or school or wherever. And, you know, they're reaching a point where their families are asking them to settle down 
you say this thing is going to work, show us. So this is a group that uh, there's a strong recommendation that perhaps they should constitute the majority of the recipient of the funds because they are, on the, they are at the point where they might drop out of the arts. So keep them in. Huh? The other one which was interesting was have very few goals that Kuanyasha shared. The fans shouldn't have too many goals, otherwise you won't fulfill all of them. The fans should find artists. Artists are too busy. Uh, the money should go directly, the funding should go directly to the artists, no third parties. Otherwise, it's not a small fund. Thank you very much.